Cartoons communicate ideas in ways words alone cannot. Today's guest uses cartoons to offer humor and insight on everything from politics to literature. He's Wrong Hands creator John Atkinson, this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. And I'm G. Wayne Miller with the Providence Journal. This week, we're joined by John Atkinson, the incredibly talented creator of the cartoon Wrong Hands and author of Abridged Classics, brief summaries of books you were supposed to read but probably didn't. He joins us today from his home in Ottawa, Canada. John, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. So, uh, you know, we, we, we first stumbled upon your work in Abridged Classics, and we want to talk about that in a moment. But first, tell us a little bit about your background. How did you become a cartoonist? Well, um, I start, as a child, I always did cartooning. Um, I love to draw. I, I was always drawing. Um, but, and, and actually, I think as a, as a teenager, I may have been so brash to even submit some of my cartoons to some magazines. Here was this brash 13-year-old thinking his cartoons were fantastic. I bought one of those books, you know, um, I think they're called The Artist Market, that shows you the, the submission guidelines for different magazines like The New Yorker. At 13 years old, I started submitting my work. I think I still have those rejection letters somewhere. Um, <laughs> Uh, so that was uh, that was going back to a long, long time ago. Um, and then the cartooning sort of fell away as a young adult. And I, when I went to university, I studied fine arts, um, you know, on the road to becoming a famous artist. Uh, so I got my degree in fine arts and um, for many years was a practicing artist, a painter, sculpture, did a little installation work. Um, moved to the big city of Toronto in my 20s to, to uh, you know, be the famous artist. Um, that didn't work out as usually doesn't for most. Um, and I realized at one point if I wanted to continue to pay my phone bill, I probably needed to do something on the side. Um, so I started doing a little bit of graphic design on the side, which I, I um, was not, I didn't have any formal training to do, but as, as a graduate of visual art, I had some of those skills. So I started doing graphic design. That sort of took over everything after a while. And then came children and adulthood and bills and mortgages. And so the cartooning kind of dropped away. I always had it in my back pocket. I always was still drawing. When the children were very young, um, I used to entertain them by playing a game where I would tell them to describe any situation and they would say, you know, oh, an elephant with an umbrella riding a bicycle. So I would immediately sketch that out for them. They would laugh and then they would color it in. And that is was the spark that started me again with cartooning. Uh, so a little later in my life. Um, so I, I think I can thank the children for that. Um, and then I, I started to work on sort of uh, back to my roots, started working on some single panel cartooning um and then one day thought i should just throw these on the internet see if anyone likes them and that was about 10 years ago i did that and here we are today and so. people people definitely like them I, I'm, I'm curious uh going back to uh even your time as a as a as a child playing with uh cartoons and um is there something about that form that particularly resonates with you I think, uh, yes, I, I absolutely think there is. Um, and of course, my biggest influence, uh, I'm sure most cartoonists my age would say the same, but uh, Charles Schultz and Peanuts, I was an avid reader of that strip. I loved it. I absolutely loved that strip. And I think what resonated with me from that strip was not only the sort of the humor of it, but I liked that Schultz uh, was not afraid to deal with uh, sort of more serious subjects. And he would often talk about philosophy and literature 
and religion and spirituality. And even as a young child, I, I think I, I think I sort of uh, connected with that. And I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed his work. And I think that's probably what sent me on my journey. Um, so yeah, I, that's pretty much, uh, yeah. So John, we're going to get into, uh, as many of your cartoons as we can, given the time. And let's start with something that, that I would say is brilliant in its simplicity. And that is tent discontent. And the first cartoon shows a tent with clouds overhead, everything looks great. And the second one to the right shows exactly the same tent, the same sky, with a caption, I hate this. <laughs> Talk, did that come from, from your experience with, with your kids sleeping out or where did that come from? It's just, it's so funny. I mean, as all your cartoons are. Well, if anyone has ever gone camping with me, which are very few people because I generally don't camp, uh, my, <laughs> my, standard line, my standard line to people is, um, I, that's why I bought a house so I don't have to sleep outside. That's my <laughs> camping joke. Um, but I think more that that cartoon, uh, like a lot of my work, just deals with wordplay. Um, I love I love language. I love playing with words. I love playing with the sounds of words. And um, I, I think uh, for that cartoon and, and many like that, you know, I do a lot of them where they're very simple that way. But I think it's mostly just playing with language and playing with the meaning. If you change a few letters, suddenly the word has completely different meaning. The image stays the same, but the, 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 uh, the tone is different. Um, so I think, that's, I think that's sort of what I was getting at there. So let's get into uh, a, a quote unquote more contemporary cartoon and that's Regency novel or pandemic life. And of course, as we're, we're hopefully coming out of the pandemic, it has particular resonance. It's both topical meaning relating to events today, but also historical. It harkens to a decade in the early 19th century in England when Jane Austen and Sir Walter Scott were literary luminaries. Break that cartoon down for us, please. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, basically it's an image of two, uh, two 19th century Jane Austen type characters standing face to face and uh, basically describing um, what it's like for both, Oh, I should back up. When we were in lockdown, when I was shut in my house, I couldn't stop thinking that this is so much like a Jane Austen novel where people are always inside, people are always sort of questioning, oh, who's that outside? Oh, why are they coming? They can't come over. Um, I, can't, I can't go near those people. So it, it just sort of grew out of that where I was, I was making that comparative analysis between how we were living our contemporary life in lockdown and how uh, in those novels, in those Regency novels, in those 19th, early 19th century novels, social uh, restraints were already there, not because of a pandemic, more because of etiquette. But I, I, I wanted to make that, I wanted to make that correlation. It made me feel happier to think I was in a Jane Austen novel <laughs> rather than a pandemic. <laughs> uh, so, the next one is anatomy of songs and again I, I you know i laughed at this but i also thought do think that that it's brilliant because it captures in simplicity but also with brilliance uh types of songs and it's called anatomy of songs and you have indie country blues pop and classic rock and i'm just going to give our audience uh, a breakdown of what you have under classic rock at zero zero which would be the beginning Come on, then you have guitar solo, then you have cars, girls, then you have drum solo, and then you have all right. And that's, that's the anatomy of, of a classic rock song. Talk about this great strip too, please. Yeah, I, again, it's, uh, and I think, I think uh, most cartoonists would say that, um, you know, boiling things down to the, its most simplest level always makes it funny. When you take out, when you take out all the detail, you take out all the nuance, you boil it down to that bare minimum, um, it becomes quite comical. And of course, obviously I'm dealing with cliches and tropes of, of popular music. So I, wanna, I, I took those different genres and sort of broke them down in the way I hear the songs. And almost, you know, for each genre, there, there's a certain um, 
there's a certain cliche that everyone follows. So that cartoon is basically these little timelines um, that, that, that tell you what to expect in every genre of song. Um, I did a series of those. Uh, I think there are three or four in that series. Um, because, uh, and, and it was interesting because I, I got a lot of pushback from people, a lot of people saying it was great, other people uh, being rather insulted that I would take, you know, their favorite genre of music and break it down to a to an enormous cliche. But um, I think it's, that's where the humor lies uh, in, in this cartoon, I believe. Um, and in most of the cartoons I do, uh, is, is taking things down to their simplest form. So John, you've published a book, uh, Abridged Classics, uh, yes. where you, um, all the stuff we were supposed to read in college, you distill down into a single cartoon. Uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, about the book uh, as a whole. Well, the book uh, came out of a series of, uh, I think, three cartoons I initially did for my blog. Um, the first one called Abridged Classics. Uh, and the inspiration for that one came from, I stumbled across an article, uh, a, a survey had been done, I believe it was in the UK, but I could be wrong. But I read in this survey that uh, apparently 60% of people lie about reading classic novels. And I thought that was really interesting. And then also 40% of people rely on television and movies for their knowledge of classic literature. And I, and I thought, you know, that coupled with our, our fascination with tweet culture and sound bites, I thought it would be interesting to help everyone out and simply take these classic novels and boil them down again to their simplest level of what they're about. Um, you know, you're at a party sometimes and you'll say to somebody, oh, I read this book, and they'll say, oh, yeah, what's that about? I have the answer in my book for you. <laughs> basically, you can basically just, you know, in 10 words or less, describe these novels. Now, I'm not advocating that people don't read. I'm simply saying I think this is a, a, funny, a funny way to um, make it more apparent to people that these novels are very nuanced. These novels are fantastic. Boiled down to 10 words is ridiculous in many, many ways. And that's what makes it funny. If you can take Moby Dick and boil it down to six or seven words, I mean, that in itself is, is, uh, is I think, is funny. Um, so that's, that's where, and, and I, I always caution students, you know, don't use any of these abridgments as book reports. <laughs> <laughs> unless, you want, unless you want a solid D minus or an F on your book report. And don't use them in your book club, uh, people, as well, because they'll ask you to leave. So that, <laughs> yeah. Hey, so, so the name Wrong Hands, where does that come from? It's a very specific reason it's called Wrong Hands, actually. Um, the, way I, the way I draw my cartoons um, is probably unlike most people. Um, I actually draw them with my mouse on my computer. Um, after I sketch them, you know, in my, in my idea book, I, I take them and, and put them on the computer. Um, I'm left-handed. My mouse is for the right hand, as most computer m mice are. So when I first started putting the cartoons onto the computer, I was using my right hand and the mouse, which is my wrong hand, because I do draw with my left hand, and I write with my left hand. So all of the cartoons that I draw are done with my right hand, hence the name Wrong Hands. Wow. Oh. That's <laughs> because you wanted to make it harder. I'm, I'm trying to understand. Well, uh... I, I think I, I initially I was I moved the mouse to my left hand and I found and this is going to sound horribly pompous and I, I apologize if it does. I draw too well with my left hand and I found I got more freedom with my right hand. Uh, it became a little sloppier. It became a little freer. It became a little more cartoony. And so I, I stuck with the right hand. Um, I guess that would make me ambidextrous after 10 years of doing it, but I'm still quite horrible at writing with my right hand. Um, but I guess I can draw with my right hand now. But that, that was the reason. And then I, I like to play on words of wrong hands in the sense that, you know, when something falls into the wrong hands, anything could happen. And so it, it, it was sort of a, 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 like I said, a very specific reason, but I also like the word play. So let's hear a little bit more about the craft of what you do. You know, do you, 
do you work every day? How do you get inspired? Where, do you, where does your inspiration come from? I mean, just talk about maybe sort of a day in the life of a cartoonist, you being the cartoonist, <laughs> or a week in the um, life, okay. right? however that works. Uh, there's a lot of sitting and staring at the wall. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of, I need to think of something funny. Um, there's a lot of naps. <laughs> I find I think I find I think best when I'm lying down for a nap. Um, I, I would say I work every day. Yes, uh, I try to produce two new cartoons a week. That's that's the sort of schedule I put myself on, um, which doesn't sound like much, but is actually difficult. Uh, I have like I showed you, you know, my I have like hundreds of you know these books, which are just riddled with ideas and notes and um, that's what initially that's the initial process is I carry these books around if something strikes me as funny if I think of a funny situation or a funny play on words I'll write it in the book I'll go back to it and try to figure out can this be a cartoon is there something that could work here nine times out of ten the answer is no um, but on the rare occasion I think okay this could be a cartoon um, so that's part of the process. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of always thinking of, you know, could this work as a cartoon? Does this make, is, is this funny? Um, and most of the stuff I do, if it makes me laugh, I figure, well, at least I laughed at it, you so, know, cause humor is a very subjective thing. It's hard to say, oh yeah, everyone's going to find this funny because they won't. Oh, you know, a lot of what you're saying, I can completely relate to as a writer in terms of, oh yeah of scribbling notes and carrying things around and you know the old trunk novel and where you where you in your case you'd have cartoons i've got books beginnings of books short stories whatever what i wanted to ask how do you deal with distractions because it doesn't matter where you live really pretty much there are distractions in your professional life and in in, in your daily life how do you deal with that i mean whether it's you know somebody knocking on the door the mail's coming or you're kind of bored and you want to check social media. Talk about that, because I think our audience would find that fascinating to hear about. Well, it's uh, you're right. I mean, there's there's any one of a million distractions any day for any of us. Um, I think for myself, as I said, I, I, I'm, I'm a graphic designer. I've had my own business now for probably 30 years, and I've always worked out of my house. So I've sort of trained myself uh to work around distraction um it took a number of years to do um but uh, it was funny when the pandemic started and everyone started working at home boy i had so many friends contacting me saying how do you do this how do you work at home i don't understand and i said it just takes practice and it takes a little bit of discipline to say you know when i go into this room i'm working and i do have two rooms in my house that when i'm in those rooms i'm working and that's how I, for myself, that's how I do it. Um, and I don't, uh, I, obviously you get distracted. I'm not gonna say I have like this rigid schedule. I don't. And um, the, there are always a number of distractions all the time. But I think it's just a question of, of trying to manage your time properly. And like I said, I, I have physical rooms I go in that I'm working when I'm in those rooms. John, you know, the, uh, there's, there's a strip that you did, uh, Disappointing Moments in Evolution, uh, which I, I adore because the, the, you know, the, you, you, you trace uh, the evolution of dinosaurs into birds over 65 million years, the platypus's uh, genetic stability for 110 million years, and then you note that over 180 million years, the crocodile, the, the famous croc, turn into a pair of rubber foam <laughs> shoes, yes. um, which I absolutely adore because my daughter has those shoes, loves those shoes, and I just don't get it. Um, <laughs> you know, so much of so much of some of your work draws from literary references. Where did something like disappointing moments in evolution come from? I, I again, I think I think it's just sort of uh, the, 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 the love of science that I have. I'm horrible at science, but I love scientific fact that that kind of works in a little bit of history um and and i think for that cartoon i was i i mean it's it's absolute uh um silliness at the end 
but I think I think that's what where the humor is that it's completely silly that the crocodile turned into these uh, pardon me for saying rather ugly shoes <laughs> hideous. Um, hideous thank you that yeah. would be a better word um and 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 you know what a, what an what a not what a legacy for that poor animal but um <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you know my cartoons uh there's a lot of literary references a lot of historical references there are on occasion some science and technology references um, I guess I'm trying to cover all the high school courses. I don't know. Um, but, uh, but that one, yes, that one just came from thinking about, it actually came from thinking about dinosaurs and how they, you know, turned into these sort of, I think the turkey is the closest relative to a dinosaur that exists. And that always makes me smile. I just <laughs> think that's, you know, Mother Nature is a mad scientist. And that just always makes me laugh when I think of that. And so I, I wanted to build on that. And the, the, the silliness of the platypus and unfortunateness of the platypus that he just never really got, he never really got going. You know, Wayne, Wayne mentioned the Regency novel or pandemic life cartoon. And I, I wanted to ask you about that. Um, did you feel a certain pressure to reflect the pandemic in your work? Somewhat. Yeah. I, I, I think um, it, it's important sometimes uh, for something that major to to try and reflect the way people are feeling i think i think most cartoonists would say that they yes they did some pandemic cartoons um it, it's it's tough sometimes because you you put pressure on yourself to say oh i have to come up with a funny idea about you know being in lockdown but i i did feel a little bit of maybe not pressure but responsibility to just speak about that and how i was feeling and hoping that that would maybe resonate with people who were feeling down and, and, you know, feeling kind of obviously shut in and then maybe, maybe giving them a smile. Um, so I did, I did a few pandemic cartoons um, and it, it happens throughout the year, you know, sort of when Christmas comes around, I usually will put out maybe a Christmas cartoon, but I try and avoid that as much as I can, because I find it, I find that if I put that pressure on myself, um, I think the work suffers because it's, it just, it, it, it isn't as natural and fluid it, because I'm forcing myself to think about certain things. Um, but I, I thought the pandemic was important enough and had affected and impacted so many people's lives that it was important to at least address that. So this is one that I looked at repeatedly. I'm gonna laugh even as I describe it. I just had, I had such a moment of joy and that's Shakespeare spoilers. And you've uh, got yes. you've got three characters from Shakespeare. You've got Hamlet, Macbeth, King Lear, and the caption under every every single one of them is quote Everyone dies. Talk about that. Well, again, that's the that's the sort of boiling it down to the bare minimum of what is the plot of of these. What are the what is the similarity between these three plays? Um, all Shakespeare tragedies, I guess, um, and. It it, uh, it it again is is that idea of just taking it down to its barest minimum and saying you know what happens at the end of Hamlet well pretty much everybody dies what happens at the end of King Lear well pretty much everybody dies and what happens at the end of Macbeth oh yeah pretty much everybody dies um, I did a similar one for uh, three Jane Austen novels which uh, under each of them it says everybody gets married yeah <laughs> which is pretty much the plot of those so and again i'm not insulting the work i'm simply making it uh accessibly funny you, you're distilling it to its essence i would say to its essence thank yes. you yes. yes you know so uh we've got about uh two minutes left today uh we could talk to you all day but um there's there's one that i wanted to talk to you about it's titled xenophobic world map and uh, yes. you've got a multicolored uh, map of the world uh, with each region labeled as foreigners, except for Antarctica, which is labeled penguins. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, do you get uh, uh, deliberately political? No. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm a very political person, but my work isn't. Um, and I, I usually avoid, I try to avoid any kind of political comment um, mostly because I find it's too easy. I know that sounds horrible, but being political seems to be all the rage these days. And I don't really want to get involved in, 
in the, the, the nonsense that's going on from all sides. So I, that one is particularly political, um, but I thought it was visually interesting. If you look at a world map and you put yourself in any of those continents, everyone else is a foreigner to you. So it's more about point of view. And that's all I was really getting at with that cartoon. Um, I wasn't trying to make any major political statement other than, you know, everyone's a foreigner to someone. And that's all I wanted to say about it. Um, so I, my work is not particularly political, but that is one of the more political ones, I suppose, uh, of my cartoons. Well, literally about 15 seconds. Was there something about that issue that made you willing to go there, as it were? I think I did that one uh, probably in 2016, 2017. We all know what happened uh, in an election uh, in your country, I think around 2016, when someone took power and was railing against immigration. And I think that probably is what prompted that cartoon in my mind. Well, that's where we need to leave it. John Atkinson, thank you so much for being with us. The Strip is Wrong Hands, and you can check it out online. That's all the time we have this week. But if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org, where you can always catch up on previous episodes. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis, asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square.